Buying your first franchise can feel daunting. A lot of money is at stake. And making the right decision can put you in the fast lane, while making a bad decision can crush your dreams. And in this video, we're going to break down the 20 essential terms that you need to know. And I created a downloadable guide that you can grab below. So let's go. Franchise or so this is the company who has the business model, right? They are the ones who are going to provide operational support and training and hopefully do a lot of the marketing and really run the system. And they are going to charge initial fees and royalties to franchisees who they grant the rights to operate their brand all across the country. Franchisee. This is the person who purchases the rights to rent the business model from the franchisor. They operate the business using the franchisor's trademarks, products, and services, and they receive support, training, and marketing from the franchisor. They're the ones, like me and probably you, who pay the initial fees to join and ongoing royalties to the franchisor. Franchise Disclosure Document, also known as FDD. A legal document is required by the Federal Trade Commission that provides detailed information about the franchisor and the franchise system. It contains 23 sections, including the company's histories, the fees, the obligations, and financial performance. And it must be given to prospective franchisees at least 14 days before they work to sign any agreement. Now, the franchisor will require you to sign an FDD receipt in order to receive this document. Now, this is no big deal since it's just acknowledging that you've received this document. The franchise agreement. Now, the franchise agreement is the legally binding document that you sign when you become a franchisee. It lays out everything that you need to agree to. So, for example, here's my franchise agreement for one of my locations, for one of my shops. And in it, it lays out everything, right? It talks about of royalties. It talks about transferring the agreement, terminating the agreement. What happens if I'm in default? What happens if I don't follow the rules, right? What are the penalties? What can I do to, to cure those penalties? So all that is that laid out here. This is the contract. Now let's talk about the FDD versus the franchise agreement. Now the FDD lays out all the terms and conditions in an easy to read format. The FDD is the basis, right? It's like the document that is used to then create the franchise agreement. Now, the franchise agreement is the legally binding document that provides all the legal jargon. Franchise fee. This is the one-time purchase that franchisees will pay franchise oars to enter into the game. You know, you can find the details in item five of the FDD that'll detail what the amount is, how long the agreement is for. And if you choose to buy multiple territories, many times they will give you a discount when you're buying in bulk. Subscribe. When you click the button below, you get to learn more about franchising and you'll stay up to date with new videos coming out every week, providing you tactical strategies on how to find, operate, and scale franchises in order to build cash flow and wealth. Average unit volume or AUV. So this is basically the average sales over you know the course of a year that a brand does. So sometimes in these things, you'll say, hey, this has an AUV of 2 million or 5 million or Chick-fil-A is like 20 million or whatever it is now. And, you know, it's just sales volume. It does not mean cash flow. However, it does allow you to kind of compare, you know, startup cost versus AUVs at a broad basis when you're looking to analyze different concepts. Item 19. This is a section of the FDD where franchisors disclose financial performance. They will provide information about sales, income, gross profit, and other key performance indicators. They can include historical data on corporate locations or franchise locations, and it should help you assess the financial viability of a franchise. Now, you have to take it with a grain of salt because franchisors have a lot of flexibility in what they disclose and how they disclose it, and they can hide a lot of things in there. And so you need to do proper due diligence, which I have other videos on, and be careful when it comes to relying too much on the item 19. Registration. A few states such as New York, California, Minnesota, Maryland, Virginia, and Washington require the franchisors to register to sell the franchises. So they then review the franchise agreements and request changes to protect residents who become franchisees. Now the challenge is that every year a brand has to re-register with the state and the franchise or can't talk to candidates or do anything while they are pending review. And it's kind of a black box and just a waiting game. And so if you're looking to buy a franchise and they say we're not registered there yet, that's what it means. And you just have to wait. Royalty. So these are the ongoing payments made by the franchisee to the franchisor. 
Typically, it's going to be a percentage of your gross sales, such as, you know, 4%, 5%, 6%, 7 8%, something like that. And you're going to pay it either every week or every month. And sometimes there's a minimum. So it'll say you're going to pay 5% of your sales or a minimum of $2,000 a month. If you don't produce enough sales to generate $2,000 a month in your royalty, you still need to pay the $2,000. Now, franchisors use that money to fund their ongoing support. They could use it for marketing. They could actually use it to run anything they want. And normally it's their biggest profit center. Startup costs. So this is the total estimated startup cost for a new location. Now, there's always a range. There's a low to a high. And the brand gets these numbers by surveying franchisees on what it cost them the previous year to open up. And on the low range, if you're buying vehicles, it could be leasing the vehicle. And on the high range, it could be buying that vehicle or equipment in cash, right? In a retail concept, the low range could be going into a location that doesn't need a lot of renovations. And on the high end could be you need to totally gut the place and you're going to spend like a crazy amount of money to outfit it. You will find all the details in item seven of the FDD. And then as you work with the brand and as you start to explore, like you will develop a more detailed budget for your locations of what it's going to cost you. Local advertising, this is money that you spend directly to generate leads for your business. You spend this money with Google, with Facebook, with Angie List, with Thumbtack, with whoever. You may also spend it on physical things like billboards or mailers or handouts or door hangers or anything else. It's used to drive business. And normally it's set as a percentage of your sales and usually has a monthly minimum. All of this is detailed in item six of the FDD. So we give that the brand or marketing fund. So there's a couple different ways they break out marketing, but this one is normally used for brand promotion. So as a franchisee, you pay in like one or 2% of your sales into this giant bucket and the franchise or uses that money to advertise the brand, right? To make brand awareness. It is not usually to drive leads and to drive like specific calls to action. It's more to let people know we exist. So you know, modern brands are spending that money with influencers or other things that they believe will help the brand overall. TV commercials, digital advertising, billboards, like whatever they choose to spend it on. So normally as a franchise, you have very little choice or you know, input in how they spend this money. Exclusive territory. Now, this is a geographic area that's granted to a franchisee where no other franchisees or company owned units can operate. You can find all the details in item 12 of an FDD. A territory like this protects a franchisee's investment by limiting the competition of other franchisees and corporates. And the terms and the boundaries and all the stuff is specified in that franchise agreement. Now, every brand is a little different in how they do that. And so you have to really read the language. Some of them may call it a protected territory. Some of them will call it a non-exclusive territory, which are completely different things. In other ones, you can only market within the territory and you can only perform services within the territory. Now, with a retail-based business like my auto repair shops, we technically have zero protected radius, but it doesn't mean the franchisor is gonna stick a shop right next to another one. However, they have the right if they want to. Now, if it's a retail concept, you should try to negotiate some sort of radius where they won't put any stores within you know, three miles or five miles or like whatever is appropriate for the brand. Term of the agreement. This is the length of time that the franchise agreement is valid for. Typically, they're 10 to 20 years. So you basically sign to operate this business and to rent the business model for the term of the agreement. Five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, most are 10 years. And renewal options may be available for franchisees who are good standing to re-up for another 10. Transfer. So this is the process of you selling your franchise to somebody else and you want to transfer your rights to operate that business to somebody else. Now, just because you and the buyer come to an agreement does not mean the franchisor will approve that person. So the franchisor has to be involved. That person has to meet their financial qualifications. They have to go through training. They have to fit the culture and all of that. So it does make it a little bit complicated when you want to sell. You got to make sure that the person you're selling to is approved by the franchisor. And this is a big reason why franchisees like to sell to other franchisees because the transfer process is easier and it's smoother, but you can also sell to an outsider. So renewal. So this is the process of extending that initial franchise agreement that you had. So you will have to sign a new agreement. So you signed an agreement 10 years ago. It has expired. They will say, hey, you pay us this amount of money. 
and we will re-up you for another, you know, 5, 10, 20 years. And when you do that, just realize like the new agreement that you're signing in 10 years that day might be different than the one you signed 10 years ago. And so you want to make sure you review it. You want to make sure that if there's any major changes that you're made aware of it. And at the end of the day, if you don't agree to it, you're going to have to sell and get out or you sign and you continue. Termination. The franchise agreement is terminated prior to its expiration. You break the rules and there could be financial penalties. You know, franchisors have to provide you a notice of what rule you broke via a notice of default and give you time to cure the issue. And if you don't fix this, this could lead to termination where they force you to sell the business or shut it down. So this is very serious and it's something that nobody wants to do. Area developer. So this is a franchisee who commits to opening multiple locations within a certain area over a certain amount of time. You know, often you'll receive exclusive rights to develop that territory, but they are going to give you a schedule and performance criteria to say, hey, we will sell you, you know, 13 territories and we expect that all of them are open within 24 months or 36 months. Or, you know, if it's a retail concept, maybe you get six months for every territory or nine months or a year. It's all negotiable, but they're going to have expectations and you just have to determine if you can open those territories within that time frame. Master franchisee. So a master franchisee basically means you become a mini franchisor. So sometimes you can buy a whole city. So like I could, in theory, become the master franchisee of a brand and then I would operate a territory and then I would be responsible for recruiting other franchisees within that territory. And then I would get a percentage of their franchise fee and I would get a percentage of the royalties and I would be responsible for training them and holding accountable and like doing all that stuff. So within the States, I've seen this happen where, you know, corporate doesn't want a large support team. So instead they sell off the country in these different portions. And then whoever becomes the master franchisee for that region takes on a lot of the hand to hand, the training in the, the day to day support. And then the corporate, they still got like software and all that stuff. The other place you see this is with other countries. So I spoke to somebody the other day who's buying the master agreement franchise rights for Canada. And so they'll find a brand in the US, they buy the rights. Now they pretty much exclusively own all of Canada and they have to pay a percentage of the franchise fee and a percentage of the royalties to the you know US-based master you know franchise or parent company. This also happens in other countries. And so it's a really great way for people who live outside of the US specifically to find a great brand, to own the brand in their market and to grow it. But they have to support franchisees and they got to make it work to be successful. So if there's any other terms I missed, please drop them in the comments below and I'll be sure to answer them and grab the PDF with all these definitions so it's easy to reference in the future. And I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.